my experiences both at the academies and at HRC, um, and then also just talk about the findings of our report. So I'll tell you a little bit of things that you probably already know, um, but you know a few findings of the report and hopefully give you some insight that you'll be able to, to take with you after this presentation is over. So I've always believed that one of the most important things that you can do for people is just to show up for them. And when they're in need, when they're celebrating a milestone or a victory, when their kid has a recital, when their car breaks down, or when they don't need anything at all, and you just want to let them know that they were on your mind. Um, in my opinion, that is the foundation of authentic friendships. So I just got married in August. Um, this is my wife and I at the reception. Thank you. Um, and she's going she's gonna to get mad at me. I told her, I was like, I'm, I'm plagiarizing your whole reception speech in my talk. Um, in her speech, she talked about is how important it is to both her and I that we show up for people and how important it is, you know, and how grateful we were that they showed up for us like in those moments um, and just, you know, holding space for each other and never really knowing, you know, what kind of day someone's having, what they're going through. But if you just continue to show up, you know, how profound of an experience, um, you know, and a gesture that is for them. And at the end of her toast, she raised her glass and said to the show up and everybody went absolutely crazy. So that the show up has replaced our wedding hashtag. And just every time I have an experience, I'm like, oh, that it kind of applies here. It applies here. It applies here too. So of course, when Marlon asked me to speak, it was the first topic that came to mind. And I told her she's not allowed to sue me for using her uh, original content. <laughs> <laughs> so I believe that showing up as your best self requires three fundamental things. One, you need to be present, which is pretty self-explanatory. You need to be there. Um, and I know that recently with the pandemic, you know, being present has meant many different things, especially in the virtual world. Um, you need to be authentic. And you also have to have the desire and the opportunity to want to change the situation for the better. And I say that because you can show up to places and to situations with maybe two or three of these traits but I would argue that you're not showing up in those instances as your best self. For example, you know, I may go to the grocery store. Um, I'm very present. Of course, I'm there to, you know, to buy my food. I'm present in the, the vegetable, the salad aisle, I'm present in the wine aisle. Let's just be real. Um, and I'm authentic, you know, maybe even more so than, than usual because I'm probably there with no makeup, you know, and some sweat. So that's just, you know, as real as you're going to get, but I'm just there to get my stuff and leave. Right. I'm not there to, necessarily improve the situation or, you know, like going there with any specific intent. So you wouldn't say, oh, I showed up today at the grocery store, right? You say you went. So when you are really wanting to, to show up in a space and to be your authentic self in a space, I feel like it has to be intentional to be effective. So then the question is, of course, how do we do that? And of course, like I was saying, you know, being present requires very little explanation. You know, that's just being there, whether it's physically, mentally, virtually, emotionally, for someone or something else, um, but it involves actively situating yourself in a situation or an event. And then of course, being authentic, your authenticity is directly linked to your intersectionality. And that's both very straightforward and also very complex. It's very easy to say, oh, just be yourself, right? But who are you? And are there different versions of you? Do they show up in different ways? And really understanding that. So we know that we all reside at the intersection of several different identities. I'm gonna use myself as an example. Um, I'm a black female, of course, first and foremost. Um, back in 1989, and I'm sure if you're in this room, you've heard of Kimberly Crenshaw and her work on intersectionality. And that, <laughs> as Marlon is snapping. And that term was first coined to describe the oppression that black women face um, you know, in different social situations and you know, just kind of structurally at large. Um, but then, you know, there's also other facets of me. I'm cisgender, I'm queer, which now also intersectionality has been used to describe, you know, kind of being at the intersection of several marginalized and, you know, multiple identities. It was a big portion of our report. It was the lens through which we viewed um, well-being, LGBTQI plus well-being. Um, so it's been kind of more recently evolved into that. But then there are other things that you may not always think about, you know, I'm Christian, I'm wife, I'm a mother, I'm an athlete, I'm a Delta, you know, I'm, I'm a postgrad, I'm, you know, fortunate enough to be middle class. And 
all of those things, you know, contribute to my experiences, how I view the world, how I show up in it, um, the biases that I have. We all have biases, you know. And then let's not act like how I actually look does not have a bearing on how people view me, you know, when I'm in different spaces, you know, how they feel about me. Um, so all of these things come into play, like when you were showing up and you may elevate certain traits, you know, like when I'm at church, you know, and I get to get to clap in and, and hooping and whatnot. Of course, you know, like the, the Christian is going to come out when I'm at home and I'm you know, talking in my high pitched voice to my one year old. You know, I'm a different person than I am here right now. And that's all, you know, being authentic. It requires that that versatility, you know, and that adaptability. And you're never being less you in any of those situations. But you also need to understand that as you show up in those different ways, you may need different things in those situations. Um, so, of course, desire and opportunity was the third component to want to show up and, and improve a situation. Um, and I know that you all know that you're all versatile, you're adaptable, you're here in the school of social transformation. So you want to show up and you want to make those changes. What I have learned recently in my work at the academies, especially in doing a study about intersectionality, about those disparities, is that it's not just about how you show up, but it's about the environment, the other people in the environment, how they're showing up and really understanding how that can affect your capacity to be your best self and understanding what you need in those situations. So you really need to ask, you know, what you need in order to show up as your best self. And so you know what you bring, but then what do you need from others? And these are the same factors. They're just kind of worded differently, but you need other people to be present for you to create space, to acknowledge, you know, that you're there, right? You need them to be authentic with you. You need them to keep it real with you, but then you also need them to see you for your authentic self, because if they don't see you, any work that you're doing will kind of, you know, fall on, on deaf ears or blind eyes. And then you need the opportunity. And so when I say opportunity, I want you to think of, think of this. So I had the, the pleasure of meeting a few of you earlier this afternoon, um, and you knew that you were coming here to hear me talk. But let's say that we didn't meet and there wasn't a talk and I just showed up on ASU campus and I had my laptop and I started walking beside you giving this presentation. You'd be like, who are you? <laughs> Why? <laughs> like, yeah, I'm okay, I agree. But like, can you leave me alone, please? I don't know who you are, right? I needed the opportunity, right? Dr. Bailey created this opportunity for me and that I was able to you know, share and we were able to kind of grow together in this way, but it's, that's very important. So it's important that you focus just as much on what you can offer a situation as what you need from the situation to kind of show up as your best self. Um, so thank you again, Professor Bailey, for creating this space for me. And then I also want you to ask yourself if your capacity to show up authentically has ever been hindered or been made more difficult by someone else, the way that someone else kind of showed up in that same situation or the opportunity that they you know, created or did not create for you. And what did you do in those moments? You know, a lot of times, especially I know that I'm talking to a crowd of like minded individuals. So I know that we've been in situations where, you know, conditions weren't always optimal and we've braved that discomfort, you know, so as not to shrink, so as not to be lesser than. But that can be exhausting. You know, sometimes it works and you push the envelope and you feel validated, you know, but sometimes it, you know, it leaves you feeling tired and defeated. When I was conducting this study at the National Academies, I had a few moments of validation, you know, the study was major progress for the organization, but personally in trying to put a lot of the things that we studied, highlighted, underscored into practice, it left me feeling very exhausted and misunderstood by the, the larger community, which is something that Marlon and I bonded on. And I think why he asked me to be here. Today. <laughs> so I'm going to kind of shift gears and talk about our wonderful award-winning blood, sweat, and tears study on understanding the well-being of LGBTQI plus populations um, and just go through some of the, the data that were in the report. But I first wanna talk about just how we even got to this point and to the report. Um, years of planning, preparation, fundraising, contacting sponsors, things like that, but we were finally able to get it off the ground. So we had the study charge from the beginning. The Committee on Population, which is um, a, a subdivision within the Division of Behavioral Sciences at the National Academies, set out to undertake a study that would just review the data and consider future data needs. So we weren't doing any new research. We were looking at the existing research in the field 
and trying to um, provide recommendations on how organizations like NIH and um, population health organizations could improve that data. Looking at the LGBTQ plus population, you know, men having sex with men, two-spirit populations, we really wanted to kind of understand like the full breadth. And of course, well-being is bigger than just say like one dimension, like health, like education, things like that, you know, it, it encompasses a lot. So this was a, a very big undertaking for us. So these were the domains that we considered uh, when we looked at well-being. And of course, this is not a, an exhaustive list, but it was the things where we knew that there would be enough data to at least start the conversation and talk about, you know, actionable goals and recommendations that we could give to other agencies to kind of put into practice right away. So we looked at families, we looked at stigma and violence, discrimination, victimization, um, the role of community and culture, resilience, um, you know, in social spaces, civic engagement, which is voter participation, political participation, um, socioeconomic status, of course, economic needs, involvement with the justice and legal systems, protection or lack thereof, of course, like social change and geographic variations, how, you know, how conditions vary from place to place and state to state. And then, of course, um, population health and well-being, on which there was probably more data than in any of the other. Um, oh, no, it's okay. No problem. Than any of the other um, factors. So we wanted to talk about what had been updated since the academies actually did a report on this in 2011. Um, but there were so many other factors to consider that we wanted to give them equal billing as well. So our study committee, see I highlighted my favorite in yellow, <laughs> <laughs> Professor Marlon Bailey. Um, it consisted of nine white individuals, three black, two Latinx. We had six cis women, six cis men, one trans man and one intersex uh, woman, she identifies as a woman. Um, we had 12 queer, we had two heterosexual individuals and while that group was very diverse, we wish that it could have been even more diverse, but it took leaps and bounds and time, more time than we ever expected to even get us to this diverse list. And I'll, I'm essentially going to tell you why in this next slide. So <laughs> this is the National Academies. This is the picture that you see when you walk in the door at um, Fifth and F Street in DC, Abraham Lincoln founded the National Academy of Sciences as the first federal advisory agency in the Civil War. That is the tradition upon, <laughs> the foundation upon which we have been built, right? The science has innovated leaps and bounds since then, obviously, right? The way we advise, who advises has not changed nearly as rapidly as what we're advising on. And they're trying, but it's difficult because of what they consider to bring credibility to a study, which is, you know, tenure. You want people that you know have been doing the job for, you know, years and years. You want PhDs who have been in the field for a long time. But who was getting PhDs back in 1860? Who was getting PhDs in 1960, right? Did they look like me and you? They didn't, right? So when you use those kind of time-specific things to measure experience, you often exclude or make it difficult for a lot of people to come in. So this is what the academies look like. When Marlon showed up at a planning meeting in 2018, this is what the academies look like. And I said, yes, I need him on my study right now. This is his opening slide in his report. I took this picture on my phone and never deleted it because it meant... <laughs> It meant that much to me. And I turned, I turned to my, my coworker and I was like, can't you see that? Like never in Academy history have there been two black men on the screen. And so I knew that Dr. Bailey was gonna bring that radical perspective that we really needed. And I knew at that moment that I needed to get him on the committee, but I also knew that it was gonna be, it was gonna be kind of difficult. So like I said, what's important for them or just kind of in general to bolster the credibility of a National Academy study tenure in the field, solid history of academic publications, prior involvement in National Academy's work, which of course you get someone who is a good contributor on a, you know, on a consensus committee. You wanna to continue to you know, tap into that person, right? Because they, they do good work, they're, um, they're impartial, 
they're educated experts in the field, and that's great. There's not a lot of opportunity for new kind of young, fresh blood, and you find yourself having to having to fight to get the people on that you need. This study, considering that it was so just groundbreaking that we were even undertaking it, I as a director, I as a black woman, I as a queer woman was not about to let this go the same way that the other studies had gone. So what was important to us was racial and ethnic diversity, of course, representation of different sexual orientations and gender identities, and having just young researchers, right, with had like different and innovative ideas. They were hard to find, and not because they don't exist, but we often either don't know about those people yet, we don't celebrate them in the same ways, you know, they're not as mainstream. So I knew they were out there, and even as we solicited um, nomination requests from queer advocacy organizations, the names that we got back were all the same white men and white women. And that was very disheartening because of course, you know that these people are good and you don't want to say, sorry, I can't use you. We have enough of you on the committee. You know, nobody wants to, nobody wants to hear that, but essentially that's, that's what it came down to in some of the situations. And we just needed them to understand that we couldn't do an LGBTQI study and have the committee be homogenous. That's just, that immediately discredits you to the people who matter, right? Maybe not to academia, but to the people that you're talking about. So it was very um, important that we did that. Now I'm gonna talk a little bit more about the study. So we had um, a planning meeting in 2018, which is where I met Dr. Bailey. Um, we had an expert meeting on the demography of sexual and gender minorities. Um, we did not use the term minorities in our study because the word minorities, as we know, is very loaded, but NIH, um, calls their office the Office of Sexual and Gender Minority Research. They were one of the primary funders of our study. So because this, this particular meeting was NIH funded, um, we use that same language. And then we had a stakeholder session at our first meeting where we heard from different um, trans justice advocates. We heard from all of our sponsors and we really wanted to know, you know, how could this study help you in your current practice? Because yes, you're writing an academic report, but it, needed to reach further than academia and we needed to understand like how we needed to go about writing that. And then of course, at our, um, at our second meeting in August of 2019, we had a seminar on amplifying visibility where we were able to hear from some of the demographics that weren't represented on the report. So we talked to um, bisexual researchers, we talked to two-spirit individuals and community advocates, we heard from a queer Muslim youth organization. We heard from a transgender immigrant organization, uh, Trans Queer Pueblo, which I believe is here, yeah, in Arizona. Um, intersex advocates and parents. That was very, a very moving and heartfelt discussion. And then other queer leaders in policy and civic engagement. Um, the former uh, LGBT rep for the the DNC. Um, one of the the top um, like survey panel experts at the Census Bureau who did a lot of um, you know, queer research. So we were really able to tap into some of those communities and let people know that we were being very intentional about hearing from all voices, knowing that we did not have the multiplicity of voices represented on the committee. So for the study, even though it was called the LGBTQI plus study, we used the term sexual and gender diverse in the study itself, not to create new terminology for widespread use, um, you know, not to coin a new acronym because there's so many acronyms already, <laughs> Lord Jesus. And they all have a place, but we knew that it wasn't our goal to add another one. Um, but and when you're talking about the community at large, because the community can mean so many things, right? Like this is just a, a small list of the more prominent um, sexual orientations and gender identities that we maybe know, hear about, or research, but you know, there's, there's more of the population is evolving and changing every day. So saying sexual and gender diverse gives us the opportunity to acknowledge that broad spectrum of human development. So you'll hear me use that when I'm talking about the study a lot more than in the LGBTQI plus um, acronym. So in understanding well-being, uh, which I said was a very broad term, there's two sides, right? There's the, the subjective kind of, you know, what you feel and what you experience and then objective, like external factors, kind of like what I was saying in the show up, right? There's like how you present yourself to the world, how you feel about yourself, um, you know, how you, how you manifest things in your own personal life, and then what you're able to do, because you could 
you could shine as bright as a diamond, but if you don't have the right economic advantage, you know, the right educational opportunities, you won't be able to show up in that fullness. So, um, you know, well-being is very contingent on you having strength in both, you know, it both within and from both sides of this. Um, and then we focus, like I said, on eight domains of well-being, which very closely match what I described in our study description. And of course, um, these were the frameworks that we used. So in addition to the domains, we had to consider, again, that, you know, when you talk about, you talk about culture, when you talk about long legal system, when you talk about education, not only is it going to present differently for different aspects of the LGBTQI plus community, it's going to present differently for people within those similar groups. So a white gay male, a young white gay male, an older black gay male, maybe you know, a school-aged gay male, right? One who's living in a rural area, one who comes from a very affluent background, right? One who's homeless because you know, their family disassociated with them. All of those things are going to play a part. So we had to think about social ecology. We had to think about of course, stigma, social constructionism, identity affirmation, you know, again, showing up. Do you, in every space, are you, you know, allowing people to, to see this side of you? Do you want them to? Do they want to, right? Like, is it something that they're taking into consideration? So identity affirmation was big. The life course, you know, kind of where you are, what you've been through when you came out, you know, how your experiences may have varied based on that. Um, and then, of course, everything ties back to intersectionality, right? How all of these aspects um, work together to kind of define you and your experience. So, of course, the first part was demography, um, you know, kind of who's, who's out there? Who do we know about? Which is also a loaded question because LGBT, queer people, sexual gender diverse people don't always show up in the data. Um, one, because it's not a question that we are always in the habit of asking on population data collection tools. Two, because you know, stigma, judgment, and several other factors, fear of disclosure, prevents them from always disclosing information when the, um, when the questions are available. So we kind of have to base the, um, the science on the data that we have, which fortunately we see the numbers are increasing, but we know that that does not encompass the full spectrum of the queer community. Um, and again, like I said, some of the analysis are, are complicated by rapidly changing trends, of course, as the external environment changes, people are more likely to, to disclose when the laws support their, you know, their identity. Right now we're seeing, you know, kind of like a major unfortunate, you know, rebound and a bunch of transgender bans and things like that. We hope that that won't have an adverse effect on the data, but as we've seen, you know, when the restrictions tighten and people don't see the benefit or the safety in disclosing, they often don't. So that may become a hindrance to research in ways that I'm very sure the people that are advocating for these bans are not even thinking or considering. And then of course, data collection, what are we doing now? Um, like I said, a lot of sexual gender, um, sexual orientation, gender identity and intersex status questions are not included in most data tools, data systems, you know, administrative records, a lot of times, you know, like, IRS data, family data, a lot of those things transfer and are used for, you know, other constructive purposes in terms of what resources you may find in the area, um, you know, who, who shows up, what kind of, what kind of medicine, what kind of schools, what kind of, you know, I mean, I worked with the census, so I'm always like, fill out your census because, you know, the an accurate population count and demographic count, you know, determines how many traffic lights you have and how many firehouses you have and you know, all of those things, but it's very much the same when you're talking about population data as well. If they don't know that these people are there, they're not going to put effort, energy, and, and funding into, you know, creating resources for them. And then, of course, longitudinal data, you know, that could be linked across multiple data sources is sorely lacking, especially for transgender and intersex communities, just because the focus on that, um, which still isn't where it needs to be, is also kind of in its infancy. Then the law and legal systems. Um, we know, and of course, this highlighted sentence that the treatment of sexual and gender diverse people in the legal system it has improved, but not uniformly. So we've made, you know, major strides. Of course, we have the ability to marry, and you know, there's different legal protections at different levels for you know local, state, and federal. We had a big workplace discrimination protection 
um, milestone that we hit back in 2020. All my years are getting conflated. Um, but there's still, you know, inequalities and inconsistencies. Of course, like law enforcement, the way that, of course, like black transgender individuals in particular, transgender women are treated, you know, when they interact with law enforcement um, is, you know, just kind of beyond atrocious in, in certain ways and situations, the ways in which they aren't protected. Um, they're disproportionately likely to be targeted by bias motivated violence by others. Of course, you know, we've also seen that as well. Um, so that's something that we had to consider when we look at well being. Public policy and structural stigma. Again, you know, the opportunities that are created for you, you know, can you show up? How are you able to show up in situations? Um, and then, of course, stigma is all about systems of power, how they're used to keep marginalized people down and, you know, enforce norms that kind of cause them to, to shrink and maybe not be authentic, be afraid to be authentic. And then, of course, sometimes be excluded for being authentic, which is, you know, can be equally as damaging, if not more. So, of course, we advocated in this report for innovative study designs that look at these things as well. Like, I know that it's hard to maybe quantify the experience, but in different kinds of observational studies, explorative studies, you know, we really emphasize, and you'll see that later in the recommendations, that these are the kind of studies that you need to do because it's not just about, you know, what's your what's your cholesterol level, what's your heart rate, what's your income, you know, there's there's so many other factors that go into that. And then of course, community and civic engagement. This is Dr. Bailey's wheelhouse. He came in there and, and turned them out. And as a sidebar, kind of the unfortunate part was that even in this very diverse committee doing this study on you know, well-being, looking at intersectionality, understanding multiplicity of experience, there were times that people tried to say that the cultural experience, you know, the religion, the, the ballroom culture, the resilience and the ways that we have chosen family and taking care of one another are not as scientifically relevant as our health data, as our economic data, as you know what's happening in the schools. These are our lived experiences, right? Like this is how we show up. A lot of times when structural stigma closes off other opportunities, we look to the culture, you know, we look to the, the community, to the social outlets, you know, to the, the, the coffee houses and the bookstores and the prides and things like that to be able to um, affirm our identities. So when you're talking about queer culture, this, I mean, there's no way you can do it without talking about that cultural experience as a data point for future research. research. And then of course, families and social relationships, um, both the relationships romantic relationships, um, both in youth and adulthood. They're both loaded for different reasons. Um, LGBT youth ex tend to experience more violence in their relationships um, and just kind of turmoil in general. I think, you know, they're still trying to figure themselves out, gain acceptance, you know, find healthy connections when they're often aren't, you know, those healthy connections at home, things like that. Um, teachers become a very strong resource, but as you'll see in the, the next slide, teachers don't always have the support that they need to be the advocates for the children that they want to be. Um, and then of course, you know, we did we, a deep dive into you know, the children of same-sex partners. And what we essentially found is that they fare the same way that children of opposite sex partners fare. And there's not, there's not a real um, difference there, which of course, many advocates or of, you know, um, different sex adoption as opposed to same sex adoption will try to say that it's a different family environment, you know, it's not as productive, it's not as safe, but the research does not show that at all. And then of course, legal relationship recognition, marriage is associated with better health outcomes. And that could be simply because, you know, people are more comfortable, you know, living their life normally in a, in a place. Now, gay marriage is recognized everywhere, whether or not it's supported is another story. Um, so this data could have come from, you know, a time when, when it was not as widely recognized, but also benefits, right? To, you know, two parent households, all of the things that come with, you know, marriage and being able to, to share in that support, share in, you know, the insurance and the resources, the income and things like that, they lead to better life outcomes, right? So it's also, it's as much holistic as it is about just, you know, the peace of mind of having the legal protection. And then of course, education, 
many sexual and gender diverse students, students experience discrimination, bullying, and victimization, which can affect their mental and behavioral health. And of course, with people coming out at younger ages, this means that they're undergoing that trauma for even more um, significant periods and longer periods in their, their lifespan. And some of the strategies that you can use to kind of combat that discrimination, adopting inclusive policies, educating and training the teachers, and then also creating an environment where they know that it's okay to speak up in defense of their, um, you know, their queer students when they are being bullied or discriminated against. And then of course, like using inclusive curricula, which is also an ongoing, an ongoing battle in many places. Economics, um, there's a clear and evidence of persistent economic inequality. Um, vulnerabilities are greater for certain groups, including transgender and bisexual people. In some areas, sexual and gender diverse groups are doing slightly better than others. I don't know if you've heard of the lesbian premium, um, where lesbian women actually tend to make slightly more than heterosexual women in their same fields. But again, is that because you know, options for families aren't as plentiful to them. So, you know, they pour themselves into their work, right? You never know what the, what the, direct, the direct correlation is. Um, gay men do better than bisexual men, but worse than straight men. And then of course, transgender and bisexual individuals, although there's least data on them, they fare economically the worst of all. Physical and mental health, um, sexual and gender diverse populations face numerous disparities. Um, including disparities that are driven by social forces. Um, the disparities are unevenly distributed based on factors such as race and gender. How am I doing on time? No okay. okay. Um, there are compounded, of course, by intersecting stressors, minority stress, racism, sexism, xenophobia. Um, a lot of the research that exists has focused on HIV, which again lends itself to research on gay men. Um, oftentimes, even though they're not the population that is most affected, you know, gay white men, you know, in the, in the data, because who's doing the research again, right? It always kind of goes back to that same thing. Um, but more work is needed both on HIV and the way that it affects other um, sub-communities within the LGBTQI plus community, but then also um, different interventions for other health concerns, heart disease, breast cancer, things like that. And then of course, access to care, right? So the kind of care that you offer, but then, you know, who, who can get it, who's available. Gender affirming care for um, transgender individuals, including like puberty delay medications, mental health, health services, hormone therapy, all of that's associated with improved mental health outcomes. Because again, like that, that affirmation, being able to show up as your authentic self, as the person you desire to be, has an effect on, you know, your daily life, your well-being, and your mental health. Um, some interventions aren't evidence-based and are very dangerous to the health of transgender individuals and other sexual and gender diverse people, um, such as conversion therapy, which we strongly spoke against in our report, and um, in, as well as elective genital surgeries for um, intersex individuals and you know, those who are too young to participate in consent of their body modifications. So after all of that, after we went through all those domains, kind of hit on you know, the major points, um, we created five recommendations, which I'll, I'll go through quickly after this slide, but this is essentially a summary of those recommendations. Um, it's important for the research community to add more measures of sexual orientation, gender identity, and intersex status, because you're not gonna know about these people and where the disparities are unless you know who you're measuring and that you're measuring these target groups. Um, explore innovative data measures. Like I said, more observational therapy. Um, I'm sorry, observational data collection and you know, different explorative measures that will really get into like the full range of sexual and gender diversity. Um, expand the research methods to better understand how, they, how people fare in these key domains. And then of course, once you have the data, link it across data sources so that the data can be applied for other service interventions and um, different types of care. And then of course, make space, create the programs. It's not just about you know, how they fare when, when data are being collected about them, how they fare when they go into the doctor's office, what kind of community support do they have? What kind of, you know, interventions, how are you supporting their well-being on a day-to-day? -day? So really just encouraging the collectors of this data to use it to leverage policy to create better spaces for these people. And so, I mean, that's pretty much what I, what I summed up here. The first recommendation is about data collection. And I can, I can share these, um, these slides with you after. 
um, improving the measurement of sexual orientation, gender identity, and intersex status, filling critical data gaps, um, facilitating the data use, linking it across the surveys, you know, trying to both remove the, the stigma and the fear of disclosure by assuring that the data will be used in ethical ways, um, but then also applying it so that it can be used in a way that these, these people in the queer community can, can see their data being used to both create opportunities and interventions for them and the people around them. And then support and expand evidence-based programming and interventions. So that is, I know that was a lot. I know I kind of started out talking about my experience and then went to the report to talk about kind of what we, what we talked about, but I hope that you can see kind of how it's all linked. And as you, as grad students are heading out into the world, you know, I know that you're gonna leave with all this knowledge and you're gonna say, I have so much to give, right? As you are looking for careers, as you are pursuing research, as you're looking at universities, think about what that university has to help you give your all, right? To help support you. They may not have everything and that's okay, but you can't go into a place that you know has no history of even attempting to expand and grow and change and diversify and expect that you alone are going to be, you know, the, the missing link, the key factor for that. And maybe you will, but it won't come without exhaustion. It won't come without strife. You know, it won't come without those things. You need support. You need a support system. You need, you know, that network, even if it's not exactly where you are, you need someone that you can, you can vent to, you know, and you need to, you need to have a plan where if, if you get to a space and they don't maybe have everything in place to give you the opportunities you need. How are you going to work with them so that you can get what you need so that you can show up to be your best self? So I will make the um, link available also to the report. The report is uh, free to download. So please download, 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 get clicks. I don't get anything for it, but the sense of satisfaction that the report is being, <laughs> is being widely spread. Um, Marlon may have a copy or two if you're, if you're nice to him, but if you have any questions, um, feel free to, <laughs> I don't know if he's going to give you that one. Is that your only one? <laughs> but yeah. Oh, okay. If you have any questions, um, feel free to email me after this and I can share um, any of the information from my presentation. So thank you for allowing me to come and talk to you all. These are the sponsors of our report as well. So I really appreciate the opportunity to be here. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. So okay. Do you want to? Do you want to? Uh, do I? Do I? Oh, I don't know. Do I need this? Feel the question, and then there are going to be some questions from. There's not anything. Oh, there. Oh. Good. Okay. Wow. Of course. <laughs> well, first of all, thank you so much. Actually, yeah. um, you did exactly, exactly the major, exact connection that I knew you would make. So I really appreciate. Thank the, you. The, the way that you did that. Right. Yes. Oh, I got it. Oh, right. <laughs> oh, the recording. Oh, got you. Well, anyway. Okay. So anyway, you, you did, you made exactly the right connections that uh, I knew you would because of your experience. Um, I'd like for you to talk more about your current position um, because your trajectory from the Census Bureau to National Academies and now uh, as as a deputy director at the Human Rights Campaign, that's a very interesting trajectory. <laughs> and it would be great to hear about your, to hear you speak on that trajectory and also uh, talk a little bit about what you do as deputy director of communities and volunteer, uh, yes, volunteer relations. Sure. So this back. So kudos to everyone in here who know who knew what they wanted to do, what they wanted to study, go, went into it right away and chose a singular path and are now thriving in it. That was not me at all. Um, I knew very early on that I wanted to help people, but in the late 90s, not really understanding kind of like the full breadth of like career options that looked like doctor, lawyer, teacher, right? Like those were kind of the, the primary things that I knew were available to me. So I actually went to college, um, went to undergrad, 
I was pre-med focused and I realized that science was not the way that I was going to help anybody. Organic chemistry completely killed my, <laughs> my, my med school dreams. Um, but I had also um, double majored in psych and realized that I really enjoyed learning kind of what made people tick, um, just kind of really understanding the inner workings of people's minds and situations. So I pursued um, the psychology. I started working in mental health when I got out of college. Um, and I knew that I enjoyed improving people's situations. I did not want to be a social worker and a social worker only. So I went back to school for criminal justice because again, like I always kind of wanted to, to fight for the, the marginalized. Um, got my degree, continued to work as a social worker in the city, continued to get frustrated because I couldn't get my families the help that they needed. They were either underqualified, overqualified, all this nuance, lack of resources, you know, all these issues. So I said, I'm going to move to DC. I'm going to start writing policy. I'm going to change the world. And of course, you know, my friends were like, okay, girl. And my, my DC friends, because I started applying for jobs, I was on USA Jobs like every day. They were like, you're not going to get a job until you move down. And I was like, well, why would I move anywhere without a job? And they said, that's just, that's how DC works. Like you have to, it's all about who you know, you have to know people to get a job. And I'm like, I just got my master's degree. I've done this, 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 and that. My, you know, my applications are impeccable. And they're like, all right, just wait and see. So after about a year of that, this is back like pre-recession when the economy was still, you know, really good and jobs were plentiful. I, I just, I made the leave. I took the leave and moved down there and started temping at a law firm because I was told that my experience as a legal assistant would translate better on paper than my social work experience when I was trying to get a job in the government. Yeah. Things are, yeah, there, yes, yeah, right. So my experience managing somebody's calendar was gonna look better on paper than like intervening for, you know, entire families in like critical need. So, so then I had, so I went from the, you know, the psychology and the social service to, um, to the legal. I worked for a patent attorney during the recession. Of course, they laid off several attorneys and they laid off their assistants. So I long-term substitute taught for a while, just kind of out of necessity at this point, all this time to try to figure out like, what am I doing with my life and my grad degree if now I'm here teaching fifth graders in Baltimore? It's a whole, a whole kind of <laughs> crisis moment. Um, did that for a while, enjoyed teaching, but kind of knew that that's not, that wasn't my end all be all was also playing football. So I started playing football in Philly, started playing in DC when I moved down there. One of my teammates was a manager at the Census Bureau. She knew that I had been applying and a job came open in her branch. And she said, if your you know, resume is in the, the pool of qualified candidates, I'll make sure that my boss interviews you for the job. It essentially all boiled down to who I knew. And I, and I, got, and I got that job. But then that is, that is honestly how DC and probably many other places, but absolutely how DC operates. So my first week there, I remember, you know, going to my friend, she's kind of showing me around like all the, all the offices, all the divisions. And I asked her where their social outreach, like, you know, where that happened, because again, I always kind of wanted to stay in touch with the community. I always wanted to give back. And she was like, oh, we have a social outreach branch. And I said, well, what do they do? She was like, well, they field complaint calls. You know, when people say, why do you want my information for the census? And I was like, that's, that's not the social outreach that, you know, that I was thinking about. Like, I don't want to spend my whole days, you know, telling people, no, yes, please fill it out. It is legit. Although it is legit and please fill it out. But that's not, you know, what I wanted to do. So when an opportunity came a few years later for me to move from her branch to the research methods branch, um, I took it, which again, she kind of always knew that I wanted to get back to that kind of closer to the community. Um, although you can't, in a data collection agency, you can only get but so close to the community. Um, and then eventually I decided that I still wasn't close enough. And so once I had some tenure and had become a supervisor at the census, I started looking other places. National Academy of Sciences as a federal advisory agency was a very close partner to census. Um, so having the skills that I had learned as a technical writer, as a research methodologist at the census actually made me an excellent candidate um, for my job at the National Academies. And I had asked them, you know, when I was there, kind of like what they were looking for. But even in the job description in the Division of Behavioral and Social Science, they wanted people with experience in social science and mental health. They wanted people with experience in law and criminal justice. They wanted people with experience in education, 
and they wanted people with experience in research and data collection. And fortunately, my random ass had done all those things in like the last five years. So, so it actually, it, it worked out perfectly. And while it's a, it's a PhD preferred job, I think me having kind of that, that very like variety, um, varied experience is what kind of helped me get there. And I was there for, I was at the academy for five years and things were going very well until last year. I mean, to put it, to make a very long story short and to put it bluntly, while I was doing this study, um, one of the members of the study committee was just, you know, as male as male can be. Um, he was white presenting, although um, not of white ethnicity. And just me as a black woman directing a study that he was on, I mean, we butt heads several times he being an outsider, you know, I went to my supervisors and said, hey, I'm having a difficult time with this person. Can you support me in these moments? And they, they tiptoed, they pacified, they, well, what can we do to make him not be so, you know, like, what can you do to make the situation better? And I just, I really didn't like how that made me feel. Um, they applauded my work. I got awarded internally for the work. We got awarded externally for the work. Everybody was really happy with it. Um, I just, I wasn't happy with how they handled me. I just didn't want to give them an opportunity to do it again. So I started looking for other jobs and I came to HRC. So now I'm around a bunch of queers who <laughs> all very much understand that people show up with different, differently in different situations and you know very much need to be supported. Um, it's great. It's been a very interesting time at HRC. We've had some very dramatic recent changes in leadership, but um, the, the sense of community that they provide and the sense of family is just really reassuring the space that they give people to, to feel all those feelings, you know, to kind of talk about what the different changes, you know, mean to them. And then also the reach, we have 32 active communities of very um, committed volunteers across the country. And we get to touch all of those in communities and volunteer relations. So our job is to really make sure that people who are doing the work on the ground. So I finally got back to, you know, the grounds. So I'm saving the world, y'all, I promise I'm saving the world. Um, you know, make sure that they have what they need to continue to do those jobs. So that's my, <laughs> that's my story. <laughs> Thank you. Do you have another question? I know you do. Somebody. Um, sorry, because I need to take this around to people who have questions. I'll have, I'll have another one done. First, I want to say thank you for coming and thank you, Dr. Bailey, for making this happen. happen. So there's this idea of uh, the show up that you described that your wife, uh, I would say coined. <laughs> um, <laughs> it reminds me of this notion of shifting uh, coined by Camille Shorter Gooden and Sharice Jones. And in that it discusses black women having to compartmentalize and uh, because of the racial and gender bias that they face in different settings. And that compartmentalizing actually um, create significant physical and psychic, uh, it takes a detrimental toll on you. So with this notion of shifting, can you describe like how in these spaces that you've navigated, how it has affected your health? Yeah, so while I was going through all that stress that I just told you about, I was pregnant in, during a pandemic. So, you know, I'm an extrovert. Um, I keep a busy calendar, you know, playing football, doing all those things. So I was already undergoing, you know, just a lot of, stress like we all were, you know, from the change, from the fear of, you know, what is, what is this pandemic? Like not, because we didn't really understand COVID at the, at the time, didn't have a vaccine. My wife being a first responder, running COVID patients to the hospital every day. So there was, you know, already all of that stress and all those things that I needed to hold before even thinking about work, right? And so I think that, I mean, well, Black women are unicorns, right? <laughs> Personally, you know, I mean, I, I think that we're, we're amazing the compartmentalization, when we have the liberty to kind of exercise it to our kind of like natural advantage can be something that works really well for us. At the same time, having to do it in ways that we don't want to use it and showing up the way other people may want us to show up in those moments without taking time for self-care and whatnot, like that can be really stressful, right? I think it's, it's one of our greatest strengths that we have that visibility, but a lot of times people don't understand both when they're asking us to kind of like play down, scale back, because it wasn't until when I was having, you know, my issue and they kept kind of prioritizing, you know, a more prestigious male's experience over mine, it wasn't until I showed vulnerability that they really took me seriously for, oh, this, this really is affecting you. I had to cry 
You know, I'm, I'm sure that there's several of my colleagues who maybe at the first complaint wouldn't have had to, you know, wouldn't have had to do that. And it wasn't that I never wanted to be vulnerable at work because like I said, now I'm in a job where vulnerability is welcome and appreciated. I knew that at my old job, vulnerability would have been taken to mean that maybe the work is too hard for me. Maybe, you know, maybe I can't handle it. Maybe I should be taken off of that and given something else instead of being given the, the support. So having to, so in that, in that point, I had to use more strength than I wanted because I always had to make sure that it looked like I was doing a good job, even though my work quality was never in question, right? And then I had to downplay the softer side of me, which was hard because I wanted to show emotion and be vulnerable and be able to have those, you know, those safe spaces and those conversations. So yes, I mean, it definitely took a toll on me. I think that um, that is the biggest thing, just us not having the opportunity to, you know, display emotion in a way that doesn't make other people question our, our productivity, our effectiveness, you know, our strength. Because other, you know, other races, other, other um, you know, classes get to do it and they get supported in that, you know, it's like, what's what you need? How can I support you? You know, and we don't get that. It's, you know, it's what's wrong with you. It's why aren't you strong like you normally are? So it's, I mean, it's definitely a, a double-edged sword. I feel like when we, like I said, when we have the opportunity to kind of, you know, like show up in our multiplicity of ways, then we can really thrive, but we don't always do that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I know you, you said you don't have a PhD, but uh, Dr. White is definitely in the house, right? <laughs> Um, so thank you uh, ever so much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Bailey, for this opportunity and definitely creating the opportunity. Um, so two questions, and I'll try to make them as, um, as succinct as possible. The first is you talked a lot about the what and a little bit about the how. Um, can you talk a little bit about the whys? What were the whys that you provided to some of your funders? What were some of the whys that pushed the project uh, along because oftentimes I know as graduate students, we have to defend what we, what we are researching or what we're proposing or any, even the way in which we're going to do it. Like what were some of the whys? Um, and then the other was, um, you know, knowing Dr. Bailey and meeting you, how did you get a group of people to move from, um, from, from proposal to plan to actual production, mm -hmm. right? To actually produce this thing, because it was a heavy lift. And oftentimes, you know, you have one person who's doing that heavy lift, but you got 12 people on the committee. Yeah. So yeah. I'm just interested in, on, in what were some of the strategies that you moved it from theory to material? Mm -hmm. um, so the biggest why, and our, um, our sponsor, our partner at NIH, you know, really, helped us with that is, you know, people are acknowledging that there are sexual and gender diverse people, you know, in the population, but we didn't know anything really about them. And it's not just enough to know that they exist because like what little research there is has shown that there are like drastic differences in their health outcomes, you know? Why is it more, you know, queer kids and black trans women homeless on the street. Like that's not just a random phenomenon, right? But you don't know why, like what economics situations, you know, lack of advantages and opportunities got them there. Why aren't you studying it? You know, why don't you know? So it was basically our passion for doing the work was knowing that it was going to be used to defend the reason why this kind of study needed more funding, right? Maybe the people who were making the decisions about funding don't realize that there are differences. Maybe they think that, you know, we got marriage equality, so we're done, right? <laughs> like, you know, we got a couple gay politicians and, you know, some gay people in the media, you know, two dads in a cartoon. We got like, good, well, you know, what else do you need, right? <laughs> so, so we needed to let them know, like, no, the work is nowhere near finished. And, you know, these people are, you know, you have trans men getting breast cancer because they're afraid to get mammograms because, or maybe they don't know that they need them because no one's saying like, hey, I know you had a mastectomy, you know, but there's still cells there that can potentially be cancerous or they don't want to go in and be given a pink nightgown when they, you know, have to go into the doctor's office or things like that. So just really trying to increase people's competency by 
I guess like kind of underscoring the, the visibility. And everyone on the panel was an advocate in their own way. Like even though you know they were all educators, and we had to be really careful like not to write an advocacy report because it had to be academic. But everybody in there really had a passion for the work more often than not, like a, a personal vested interest as well. So the why came very easy with, with the group that we had. The work came a little <laughs> less easy, but it's also just because, you know, they're, they're fighting for their lives, they're fighting for other people's lives, they're teaching classes, they're doing all these things, you know, so they're very, you know, very busy people, very like, you know, new kind of early in their career, definitely felt like herding cats a lot, <laughs> a lot you know, just trying to remind people, ping people, hey, you know, we need this. And then of course, once we stopped meeting in person, you know, the kind of pandemic kind of hit, like right when we were going into like peer review for report. And so people just kind of started, not, not I mean, not disappearing, because I don't want to say everybody had their own stressors, but they had so much more to think about. Um, so it was really difficult to kind of like just pull every, like reel everybody back in, you know, pull them together at the end to do the writing. So um, it was difficult. I had an amazing um, project consultant who definitely helped me, you know, stay on people's lines and, you know, pick up the slack with the writing. You know, when other like people on the committee, you know, got too busy. But I mean, overall, I will say that everyone in the group was was very passionate about the work. And even though they had other kind of competing priorities, you're really able to to pull it together and make it really good. Well, I definitely thank you for turning passion into power and power into production. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for your presentation. So. My question is a sort of um, the thing that's been top of mind for me for a very long time, and that is moving from woke to work. And so I'm wondering if you could talk just a little bit about, and, and maybe this is a personal reflection, but also, you know, you talked, I, I really appreciated the discussion about the importance of the academic rigor um, of these kinds of reports, right? That these aren't just folk getting together and anecdotally collecting and, and putting, but there is a, a, the peer review process, having people with certain credentialing and yeah. really taking your time to do, to do this work. Talk a little bit just about your experience navigating, especially since, you know, the resurgence of the Black Lives Matter movement. Talk a little bit about kind of navigating that space in community, and I'll put it in air quotes, where you're struggling with a desire for change immediately in a kind of, I guess you could say, under the umbrella of wokeness yeah. with the, the, the sheer work. And this goes to Jamal's piece about how did you get people to like sit and write and do yeah. the work? Like that is the work. Do you think about sort of, or, or have you reflected on some of that struggle between wokeness and work? Yeah, um, very much so. So I think I started realizing that, like, so the census now um, asks about, like, same-sex partners, you know, is your, basically, you know, are you married, partnered, whatever, you know, what gender is your spouse? That is, like, a relatively new, like, phenomenon. Sorry, my alarm is going off to remind me to pick up my child from daycare. Which... <laughs> 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 right? 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 Um, but I remember when I first got to the census in like 2009 or 10, just thinking that it was, you know, interesting that like kind of those, those kind of questions like, you know, about like those types of domestic partnerships weren't on there. And they would say, you know, it's coming, like we are working on it, but it had to be written. It had to be, you know, like very rigorously tested that it had to go out like first internally and bring people in and make sure they understood the question in English and then in Spanish. And then you had to put it on a test form. And then you had to literally like run a test survey through production, back through data collection to make sure that at all the points where you're entering this new data, that, you know, it, it can be validated, it can be collected years, like three to five years, just to get any change whatsoever on a survey like that. And that blew my mind. I mean, and it made, it made sense, right? Because if this is going out to the population, you know, I remember when we wanted to add internet data collection to the ACS, um, we did multiple forms. We did one where we like sent them a postcard and said, you know, fill it out online. Here's the link. And we sent out one that, that was a letter that said, you know, you can use this link or you can wait. We'll send you a survey in a couple of weeks. And then we sent a survey that had the link like, you know, on it. So it was like the paper with an option to see like what resonated with people. And I remember when we were writing the letter, 
um, we were trying to figure out like how to basically say, you know, do this now in the link or you can wait. And I said, well, why don't we just put a, a semicolon in between, right? Because it's like two, you know, two matching thoughts. And they were like, we can't do that. And I said, what do you mean? Why can't we use a semicolon? They said, we have to write it at a fifth grade level because you never know, you know, where these surveys are going. And I know I'm kind of going on like a bit of a tangent, but so many things have to be thought about before you enact something universally for like a large population, right? And so, and that sucks because, you know, you do have things like last year was, last year was a shit show, like, you know, with the, the racial uprisings and the killings and the pandemic. And that was happening, like just as we had kind of put the ultimate finishing touches on the report, but we didn't have the time to go back and reconvene and rewrite, you know, about the, the trauma and the violence and the racial disparities. So, but we also couldn't release a report in 2020 without calling it out in some way. So we wound up um, writing a prologue to the report where we kind of talked about what was happening, you know, as we were reviewing it. And then also um, pandemic wise, kind of tying that into like, we don't know how the queer community is really being affected by it because at that point in time, only one or two states were even collecting data on sexual orientation and gender identity while they were like researching COVID-19 cases in their states. So kind of, again, like you don't know what's happening because y'all aren't collecting this data, right? Um, in underscoring intersectionality in terms of, you know, like violence against black individuals. And, you know, like, yes, like we, you know, we have names like Breonna Taylor and George Floyd that we can call out, you know, but if, if I asked you like, you know, who are the, the last five black transgender women, you know, in the news, you know, who were victimized, a lot of us, you know, myself included, could not just like readily, you know, like pull up the, those names and those lists. So the prologue called a lot of that out, but yeah, it, it's, it's hard. Like you get why you need the time, but it is really, it's really difficult and just trying to move as fast as you can, but knowing that it's academia. So you can never move quite as fast as you want. So yeah, that, I mean, that, that was how we, we kind of like had to add an appendix to it to call it out because we couldn't, we couldn't not to put this out and not so you will see that in the report. Other questions? Oh, I have some. I have another one. <laughs> um, so this is a two-part question. One is that um, I like that you pointed out the challenges that we face around culture and resiliency and the, you know, some of the um, <clears throat> resistance to including culture and community practices and cultural formations and performance and pride and those kind of things as a as important data sets for understanding the well-being of LGBTQ plus populations, particularly what LGBTQ plus populations do for themselves to create environments and conditions under which they can um, improve their well-being and, and thrive. So I, I'd like for you to talk a little bit about that because this is a, inter, a transdisciplinary school. Uh, we promote and foster humanistic inquiry and social science inquiry. We, per, we train and want to produce students who engage in research across fields and across methodologies. And our signature uh, training in terms of how we train our students uh, to do methods is that it's not necessarily about the actual approaches, it's about the question and what approaches you will use to address the question. And I think this is an important because there was some translation that you had to do in order to get some of my former colleagues and some of the um, leaders on the, on the committee to understand how important um, culture is and how to actually uh, see it and recognize it as evidence, right? So that's, the, that's a, I know that's a long question, but that's the first question. The second question is um, kind of related to, to the first one. The, the, how did you feel uh, about, or oh, what did, what would you say about the the vast diversity? I mean, because you talked about intersectionality and your 
your initial aims in terms of constituting a committee that could actually produce a report that recognized the vast diversity among the LGBTQ plus population, as opposed to previous reports that had, you know, primarily focused on so narrowly on white LGBT communities and narrowly on only certain aspects or certain measures in terms of health as opposed to health and well-being. Um, so talk about what, in, in your view, talk about what the report actually produced in terms of the vast diversity in the community, what it tells us about how vastly racially gender, how vastly diverse the, the population is in terms of race, gender, sexuality, ability, region. I mean, there's uh, religious practices, the whole nine. All right. Um, wow, those are the longest two questions. <laughs> <laughs> um, the first question. So, yes, so you and um, your colleague, uh, Angelique, who is, who, um, introduce us, so yeah, shout out to her. Um, we're, I mean, you're already doing very radical work. So you write very radically. And people on the committee who had been on prior academy studies knew that the way that they wrote isn't how normal academy studies sounded and wanted to kind of tamper it down, a little bit of whitewashing. And not, I'm not blaming them, because it wasn't just up to them to determine the content of the report. It still had to go to a set of peer reviewers who were also people who had probably reviewed other National Academy studies in the past and were used to them being written a certain way. It had to go through an editor. We contract with specific, a handful of specific editors who do National Academy studies. So if it hadn't been them, it was probably going to be somebody down the chain. And that happened more often than you know, that I, I wanted it to. And I really had to work with, um, with my team of like kind of program officers uh, that were helping me to direct the study and with the consultant and, you know, go back and forth. One of the, one of the chairs didn't like that the end of the chapter on, um, on health and health opportunities ended with a discussion of resilience. She felt that it was too strong and it would make a strong recommendation, but resilience is what keeps us alive in, you know, in many cases. So, why can't we call it out? And she asked me to change it. And so I purposefully punted and I said, if you wanna change it, you have to convince the expert writer of this chapter, who is not you, why it needs to be changed. And we did that um, a lot with, you know, with the cultural work. Like if you don't research culture, you can't really speak to you know, how it needs to be addressed. Like, yes, we have to call out that black people aren't represented at most mainstream prize, which is why we have black prize and why we have counter prize. And, you know, because people of color, like, don't get those, you know, those opportunities. Like, we need to say it. We can't say people from marginalized groups don't always find themselves. <laughs> no, like, black people don't feel welcome in pride. Like, say it. So, so there were, yeah, I mean, there were a lot of that. And this is coming from, like, LGBT researchers. This isn't coming from, you know, like, from straights or people that aren't, like, regularly in touch with this. But it's not everybody's experience, you know, that, that intersectionality, I mean, it, it works, it works both ways. You could be at a couple of intersections, some shared intersections and, and bond over that, but you may not have my full experience because you're not at all of my intersections. So we wrestled with that, you know, even, even within the community. And it was my job as study director to adjudicate that, which was fun. <laughs> um, and then, okay, wait, the, the second question. The second, well, the second question is kind of connected to your first answer is that, so doing all of this work and the kind of day-to-day -day managing of the project. Oh, doing all this work and kind of the day-to-day -day managing of the project and using strategies of translation and strategies that you just described. Like, hey, if you want this to change, you need to talk to the person who's the expert, right? Um, how do you feel about what actually, what actually, what was the outgrowth of that, that work? Because what it revealed is vast diversity in the community across a range of categories yeah. um, that you would not necessarily have been able to capture 
if you didn't do some of that work, including how you constitute how do you how you constituted the committee, but also the the integral the the sort of day to day um, strategies that you had to use that actually were about translation or, or about like look letting the person let let the person who's the expert talk about culture. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean it, it really. For me, it all boiled down to us being accountable to the people that we're writing about, which I feel like is important. You know, when you do physical science or biological science, you know, like it's very, very cut and dry. You're talking about cells, you're talking about gases, you're talking about dirt. You know, you can, you don't have to, you don't have to be dirty to talk about dirt, right? But like, you can't, you can't really tap into the, the lived experience and the situation and like, make prescriptions on what would improve a, a gay person, a lesbian person, you know, a, a transgender person's well-being if you're not at all in touch with their experience, right? So it all came into like authenticity. I don't know, I probably can't see. I had a picture up there, but even this cover, so there's a man on here in leather in the cover because gay men wear leather. It's a, it's a thing. It's They have leather weekends. You see, I love leather weekends. You can see it's so lit. But like, you know, I actually, I said of all the pictures, because I had to kind of like give them, you know, examples of stock photos that we wanted um, to put on the cover. And I told my editor, I was like, I will fight for this picture tooth and nail. <laughs> tooth and nail. Just, and you know, and, it, and it's, it's, a, it's a white man. So of course I wasn't like, you know, I had to make sure that we have people of color, but I was like, I want people when they pick up this book to actually see people who look like the people that they associate with, the people that, you know, they're friends with, that they love, that they're married to, that they care about, you know, that look like them. Um, so, and a lot of times, like I may have done a little resistance, but if I was able to say like, look, who am I writing this for, right? Like that was kind of my, you know, my leverage with that. And then um, kind of same thing with like, what's inside of the report. Like I said at the beginning, wanting to write it for the academic community and the policymakers, but also the, you know, the health organizations, like, like Fenway, you know, like Whitman Walker and the places where there are people doing the research, you know, who also need to say to their, you know, their clients and their patients, like, look, we are trying to learn more about this so we can get you help, right? And so that they know, because your average, you know, queer person probably is not gonna pick up that book, but someone who they interface with is, and they need to know that like, that that data, those data are coming, you know, that it's on the horizon and hopefully, making some traction that will help them do their jobs better. I, I asked you that question because it's real important for those, those of us um, who do research and who conduct research that has policy implications that representation matters. So the example that you just talked about is really important, that it may be viewed as an insignificant thing, but who appears on the cover is essential because you you want to try as best as you can to have representation on the cover that reflect the recognition of various communities in the actual report so that they can see themselves. And the question that you constantly raise, who are we writing this for? And that was um, when I, when, uh, I approached writing the community and civic engagement with um, Angelique Harris, I was also thinking about that. And I was, I was, I learned a lot about the communities that I didn't even know. And I learned by actually doing research and writing about it. Um, two spirit communities, um, other, and I, I was able to talk about other uh, non institutional religious practices that include queer people um, and also Muslim. Um, LGBT Muslims, and that was uh, also um, based on the the panel that we had, the seminar that, seminar that we had, and then I did further research on it because I wanted to make sure that those communities and those practices and those institutions were acknowledged, rep uh, represented, and recognized within in the report as a part of not only the LGBTQ plus population, but contributing to the well-being of LGBTQ plus populations. Other questions? 
Thanks again. This was great. Uh, excellent talk. Um, you mentioned a few things that just, I just tried to write them down verbatim. I mean, just gems that you kept dropping. Uh, one that stood out, and as you're talking about navigating, like getting people to get, you know, herding the cats and doing all of those different things you have to do and negotiate, you mentioned that you're not being less in of you in different spaces when you had to put forth a different identity or, a, you know, put that one forward. I wondered if you used some of that moving in and out of your identity strategically to help you move through the process and negotiate with the other people on the committees. If so, how did you do that? Um, Marlon's probably a great example. I don't cut up with nobody on the committee like I cut up with Marlon. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, so, you know, I feel like, of course, you know, anybody you meet, something different about them, like as you engage is going to, you know, it's going to resonate with you. So it's not always about, it's not always about being, you know, completely like a different person in, in space to space, but whatever is, whatever is talking, speaking to you from that other person, like tapping into that experience to initiate conversation, you know, to, to have those interactions. Like, that's what I mean when I say, like, you know, elevating and amplifying like different parts of your identity. So it's not necessarily that you're shrinking others. It's just that, you know, if something is, if something is glowing or, you know, if something is pulsing, like I was, you know, talking to Felicia about being a mom, like, I'm not gonna have that conversation, you know, with you, right? Like we went, how long did we talk about potty training and, you know, and, and, and diapers and things like that? Or, you know, I'm not going to sit up here and, you know, talk to you like I talked to my, you know, my one-year-old. Like, who's, you know, who's, who's, who's mom's favorite student? Like, I'm not, you know what I mean? Like, those, those things. So, so that is, that's more um, what I meant from that. But, you know, to your point, there were some older people on the committee. There were younger people on the committee. And I absolutely approached them differently. Also, to try to get them to, you know, to do the work, you know, a little deference, a little, you know, a little hand holding, a little like, you know, hey, like we're really counting on you. So it was equally as kind of mentally strategic as it was me drawing on, you know, like things that were inside of me. You know, some people like get text and be like, girl, <laughs> you know, I need you right in the room, right? But I knew that that like we speak the the same language because we might be like the same generation or you know, kind of have have those same backgrounds. Um, and I think that that helped me when I did need to adjudicate like between two people to kind of know, okay, what's really going to resonate with this person just based on the relationships that I build. And I think, you know, I, I know people, very smart, very educated, kind people who feel like authenticity means you got to show up the same way every time in every situation. They always be trying to teach somebody something, you know, they just like never let, you know, let their hair down and just like relax. But I also feel like we also need that space, you know, to be vulnerable, but not vulnerability doesn't always have to mean sad crying, you know, I should be able to use imperfect grammar in my text sometimes, you know, I should be able to, you know, cuss or send politically incorrect gifs, you know, in my, my group me with my friends, but then know that if I said, like, if we were back in DC and I said, hey, y'all, I have a talk, you know, can you come show up? They would ask me questions longer than Marlon's, right? Because they, you know, like they know how to turn it on. So I just, I think it's really important, one, to your own like mental and physical health, you know, and then also to the relationships that you maintain to be able to know like which part of you is going to resonate, which part is going to thrive, and which part's going to get fed, right? Like when you go into a situation. So, so I definitely use it, but I also use a little bit of like psychology because I don't do tests to get them to do what I need them to do. Other questions? Yeah. Yeah, Joe. Yes, ask them any. So I just want to preface this with that is the academic lineage that I come oh, come okay. from right there. Um, but right, all right. But no. Um, but I won't make these these questions too uh, too long. But I will ask: um, Do you think that some of the recommendations that you all uh, put forth will um, inspire some uh, entities and some bodies to actually change their um, idea of evidence, uh, what, going with the evidence base. Uh, and then uh, the, other, um, the other question uh, that I had was,
oh, the um, the desire and opportunity uh, uh, piece. And if you could um, connect the desire and opportunity piece back to your defining your leadership um, uh, through the, the radical self inclusivity, mm -hmm. uh, if you could connect that desire and opportunity back to that. Yeah. Um, and then the other question, of course, being, uh, do you think that there's any entities right. that will uh, change their idea of evidence and actually put money behind it? Yeah, yeah. So I'm going to answer those in reverse. Um, first answer is very simple. You got to know when you're running into a brick wall, right? Like you, I mean, that's, that's it. Like you can have all of the capacities for a leader. You can, you know, understand how you're showing up, but your fight to some end has to be productive for you, you know, to make any type of substantive change. And that's not all of you. And we as humans, myself included, you know, I'm very confident in my abilities. I think I can do a lot of things. And it took me a while to realize that like, it's never just up to me. And, you know, like how well I am able to do anything that does not solely pertain to just me, right? Like in friendships, relationships, you know, I'm very type A, like I'm a Capricorn. So I would even, you know, in my in my younger days, if I had to tell somebody something difficult, you know, I would stress over like how they might react and then change my delivery in anticipation of like what they might say, you know what I mean? To try to like prevent us from having to go down some of those like complicated roads. And then I realized like, I, I can't control how anybody else feels, you know, I can't control what anybody else wants. I have to say what, what my truth is, leave it out there, you know, and let them digest. And also I'm not going to be able to, I'm not creating the opportunity for them to be authentic if I try to script it in a way that is like most self-serving to me, right? And so like leadership happens the same way. Like people think that like leadership means, you know, total control or, you know, being able to like, you know, manipulate like all situations. I forget who said it. I, I really wish that I remember, but I was listening to a TED talk a while back. And um, the gentleman basically said that like the, the biggest quality of a good leader is for your work to be carried out like, you know, in your absence, right? Because there have to be people there who, you know, who want to be led, you know, who like what you're saying is resonating with them to some degree. Like you may have to, to coach them up to get them to like fully understand like, you know, what your mission is. But if there's no inkling of, of opportunity for that, then you really have to ask yourself like, you know, why, what am I doing in this space? Like, do I need to change my approach or am I fully committed to this approach, but just need to, you know, to go somewhere else for it to really like thrive and be, and be productive. So that's kind of, you know, what I meant with like really understanding, like, what am, what am I here for? Like, is this, you know, am I here to feed my ego or am I here to really make change? And what's, what's that gonna look like? How am I gonna get what I need from the environment to really make that change? Um, the other question, yes, I, I do feel it's going to make change, all change, like I was um, telling Mako, takes incredibly long, um, but NIH is super committed to, you know, increased funding for this research, and they have reached in so many arenas and in places and kind of, you know, like, especially like in the, the policy world, that I do think it'll gain some traction. Another reason why we, um, you know, disseminate, we talk about it all the time, we shop it around is because we want people to know that it's a resource, it's free to download, like, you know, like use it, use it, read it, apply it. We don't know everybody's gonna read it cover to cover because depending on, you know, what, what, your, what your field is, you know, what your need is, you're probably gonna go to that place. But there's also like references in that, the, the writers are, you know, like very accessible and are still out kind of, you know, like spreading the, the word on the report, so. I do believe that it will make change because people are still talking about the 2011 report that they did on LGBT health. So if that made traction, it was only on health. I'm hoping that this one, because it does tap into so many things, will have broader reach. So kind of crossing my fingers on that. Other questions? Any questions from live stream? Any, uh, okay. Other questions? Wow. Well, let's give Jordan White a huge hand. Such an excellent talk and appreciate all of the 
important information and guidance that you offered and testimony from your own experience, but also the incredible work that you continue to do um, and, and, and bringing institutions in conversation with communities in, in actual real ways. So I really appreciate